Um, so The Secret Stealers is very similar to my other books in a couple ways in that it's about female friendships and strong women in history, but it's, a, it's, a, it's different in the sense that it's, it's faster paced, it's a little more like drama, intrigue, danger. And so it takes the elements of my other books and, and adds a bit of a twist to it. So what am I gonna talk about tonight? Um, I'm gonna talk about how I found, I came up with the idea for this book, this novel, and a, some about my research pro project. Um, research is my favorite thing to do, um, but it, it, this project was particularly daunting. Um, so inspiration, I'm gonna talk a lot about 1940s French and the French resistance, because that's a big part of the, the novel story and also um, inspiration for my characters. So I keep a file on my computer and, um, and anytime I see an article or anything really, website, whatever, sometimes now it's really nice people send me stuff um, that I think might make a good basis of a novel, I just file it away. And so this particular article was from 2016, actually, before the Saturday Evening Girls had come out and I would filed it away. Um, it was actually an obituary about a, this woman, Stephanie Czech Raider. She was the daughter of Polish immigrants. They lived in Poughkeepsie, New York. And um, she, was, she was brilliant and her, she spoke Polish fluently. And the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which is the precursor to the CIA, which I'll go into, recruited her to go to Poland as a secret agent, as a spy, at, right at the end of World War II, actually. And I just thought that was so intriguing. I didn't know a lot about OSS, the OSS. And I didn't know there were many American female spies um, at or around World War II. So that, you know, when I was thinking about like what I'm going to write about for my third novel, this was, this was one of the stories that has kind of stuck with me for a long time, obviously for years. So then I found this article, which is so delightful and charming. And I will post both of these articles on my website if you're interested in reading it. Um, these are two women, Betty McIntosh and Doris Borer, and they both worked for the OSS, and then they both worked for the CIA, but they did not meet each other until they were at a retirement community in their 80s out in Virginia, um, and they, became, they realized the connections um, and became best friends, and while they didn't share all of their stories, because they were still, you know, it, at, in, in their heart, they still were they still were CIA agents. They did share some of their stories. And um, the, the article was delightful. And some of their stories was amazing. And um, Betty is right here. This is Betty, the back of her head. This is Doris. And then this is Doris back in the day when she was an agent, which is just unbelievable. I'm going to go back and forth again. It's, I, I just, and I couldn't believe this photo. So Doris obviously was pretty badass and, um, and Betty was as well. She told the story about how she was working in China as an agent and handed off a what she thought was a piece of coal to um, a Chinese secret agent who then went on a train, um, kept, put the coal on the train because it was actually a bomb and then jumped off the train and, a bun and the train exploded. And that was something, the, the people were killed, many of them were military that was part of the mission, but that was something that stayed with her for her whole life. She had some regret about doing that and how that happened, even though she didn't even know what was going to happen with this, with what she thought was a piece of coal. So those were, you know, just a few, a couple stories that I was like completely sold and intrigued. I think anytime you're getting into a big writing project, like a novel, you've got to be passionate about the story. You've got to love it um, because you're going to live with it for a long time. So I really, I wanted to write about these women who were working in the shadows of the war, who were spies for um, America through the OSS, um, the Special Operations Executive, the SOE in Britain, and also some, some of the women of the French resistance. My research, this is one of my bookshelves. I've got another one on the other side of the room. It was, this was hugely challenging because unlike the Saturday Evening Girls Club and the Club of Yale Girls of World War II, um, there's only a finite amount of research about those topics. Like you can hit an end point because they're smaller, they're kind of niche topics in history. Um, but however, the French resistance, the OSS, the SOE, 
um, you know, the whole, you could go, I could still be researching now. There are dozens and dozens of books. There are archives and museums and um, classes taught. Um, but, you know, at some point as a, you know, as a writer and a researcher, you have to kind of say, okay, I have, I have what I need. Another thing that was interesting is they declassified the OSS personnel records only in 2008. So I was able to access some of those as well and, and um, read the profiles of some of the women there. So that was tremendously helpful. As I did I kind of figured out the outline and the narrative arc of the story, it was clear that Paris was going to be a huge part of the story and almost, almost like another character. So of course we had to go on a research trip um, to Paris. So we drank a lot of coffee while we were there because we were there five days and I had lots of goals for like what I wanted to get done and the research I wanted to get done. This is outside at one of the many, many cafes in Paris. One of the things I did before we even left for the trip was I found on TripAdvisor these historical tours you can sign up for. So we signed up for a private historical tour with Nigel. He does World War II tours. He's a professor. He's an expert um, in all things occupied France during World War II and the French, French resistance. And um, we spent almost a whole day with him and we walked miles all over the city. And, um, and he really helped, you know, he not only answered all my questions, but he brought up details and things I had knew nothing about that also kind of ended up in the book. And um, so thank you, Nigel, wherever you are. And, um, and yeah, he was just wonderful. One of the things we talked about when we were with Nigel was what happened with occupied France in World War II. Uh, and what happened was the country kind of became occupied ne nearly overnight. It was in June 1940, it, the Germans came in and the country was split in two. And as you see, it, Paris was in the occupied zone. And of course the entire coast was in the occupied zone. And then they formed this free zone that was headed up by Marcel Pétain and in Vichy. So this was the Vichy French government, which was supposed to be the free zone and the free government of France, but it was really kind of a, a puppet government from the start. Um, and the Vichy France regime collaborated with the Germans. And then really uh, two years later, Germany occupied all of France. Parisians on June 13th, 1940 went to bed. And then June 14th, they woke up to the sound of German, a German accented voice over loudspeakers driving around saying that the, a curfew would be imposed that night by 8 p.m. And the Germans had occupied the city of Paris by that evening. Uh, and this is Hitler, obviously, in front of the Eiffel Tower. So it, it was like overnight, their lives, the Pari life of the Parisians changed tremendously. And it was a shock. Um, and in the beginning, the Germans, you know, there's a, there was a lot of accounts of Parisians saying, well, in the beginning, the Germans tried to be charming. They tried to act like this was all going to be fine. Life would go on. But as you can see, I mean, the landscape of the city changed. The Nazi flags were everywhere. Germans were marching all over the city. The Germans had a photographer take these pictures as propaganda to show the world, see, the Parisians are living fine in occupied Paris. Things are going, you know, things are going great. Yes, we're occupied, but everyone is living peacefully. Um, but, you know, here's the German signs that were on every intersection corner. This was another of the pictures that was kind of try to sh trying to show that life was normal, but right under the surface, it was clear that life was not normal. Um, this is German, you know, Germans were in cafes, Germans were walking through the city, you know, French, Women were still into fashion, um, enjoying life sitting outside in a cafe. Um, textiles were at a premium. And so they all, a, a lot of women made homemade shoes and soles out of cork. That was a big thing. Um, but un, so as I said, underneath the surface, things were not okay. And things started to turn pretty quickly. I, you know, they went from trying to be charming to the Nazis to showing their true colors. And as you can see here, um, one thing that changed almost immediately is that um, Parisians couldn't drive their cars anymore because the Germans had all the petrol, all the gas. So people were biking everywhere. There were horse and buggies everywhere. 
but still, you know, this is another propaganda shot. Oh, here's a nice Nazi German band entertaining people in Paris. However, you know, by 1941, things started to go get really dark in Paris. And this is a picture that really um, chills me because here's this man um, walking behind this woman and he's wearing a yellow star. So slowly and sh but surely, and actually not even that slowly, the, the Nazis started imposing rules on the Parisian Jews, including everyone requ were required to wear a yellow star any even if you were a child, if you were over the age of six, you had to wear this yellow star. Um, so that was the first thing. And, and let me just tell you, these were not newly arrived Jewish people to Paris. These were families. Um, these were people's friends, people's neighbors. They had lived and, and they had lived there and their families had lived there for a hundred years or more. These were, these were French people. And it was horrifying for people who were not Jewish to see this start to happen. So it started with the stars and then it was, you, you know, they couldn't um, go to certain stores. They couldn't go to the movie theater. They couldn't go to restaurants. They couldn't sit in the park. You know, any of the city parks, they weren't, weren't allowed to. Um, they couldn't cross the Seine. Um, this is a father who looks terrified, um, fleeing with probably everything he owns. Um, you know, there was a, a lot of people fled Paris when, for, at the beginning of occupation. And then many of them saw what was happening and just were trying to get out of there as quickly as possible, particularly if you were a Jewish family. Um, by 1941, literally everyone in Paris knew someone who was arrested. And then the first major roundup of Jewish families to send to the camps happened in May, 1941. That was, you know, this was one of those things where, you know, Parisians were trying to just get on with life and figure out how to feed their families with ration cards and stand in the lines and, and try to not upset the Germans. And these thing, then these things started happening and a rage among uh, Parisians um, started to kind of boil up because they couldn't believe that this was happening, that they were doing this to their friends and neighbors. Um, and that's when the French resistance really started to rise, the sense of patriotism among the French people because they saw this and they could not ignore it. Um, the second major roundup was probably a, a, you know, from what I've read, a real major turning point. And this happened July 17th, 1942. And the thing that was horrifying to the French people, the people of Paris, is that the French police under the Vichy government assisted in the imprisonment of over 13,000 Jewish men, women, and children in the velodrome, in this huge, huge sports stadium in the middle of Paris with and they were kept there for five days with no running water, um, barely any food, one or two toilets for all of those people. And then from there, um, they took them away to Auschwitz. And, um, and like I said, this was a lot of parish, a lot of the friends of these people who were rounded up were trying to at least save the children, get the, get the kids out of the stadium. Um, doctors and nurses were going there to try to help. It was, it was a horror that could, there was no way the people of Paris could ignore. So this is a plaque that we saw about the, the horror at the velodrome. And it says that, you know, the over 13,000 Jewish pe people were arrested and de uh, deported and assassinated at Auschwitz. The wording is very specific on this plaque. It says over 4,000 children, over 2,900 women and 1,100 men. They were kept in, in inhumane conditions in the velodrome. And then this part is really interesting. And there's still a great amount of shame in France and in Paris for, for this incident and some of the other incidents that happened during World War II. Um, the wording is interesting because it says, per, the police of the government of Vichy, it's kind of set, they want to not take responsibility. They want they don't want to say this was not France, this was v the Vichy government, per, per the order of the not Nazi occupants, um, help that, you know, help this happen, rounded up these women and children and, and men and sent them to the concentration camps to be executed. Um, and it's such a source of shame and horror for um, the people of Paris that it they demolished it. It doesn't. This was where the velodrome was. This is the sports where the sports stadium was. 
it did, no longer exists um, because it, it, just that plaque and a little memorial place is there. So as this is happening, you know, the rage of the French people starts to rise. Fr the French resistance starts to grow and really organize as this is all happening. Um, and the allies, the, the Americans and the British see this from afar and they say, well, you know, we need to tap into this. Um, but before I talk about how they did that, I want to talk about step back and, and tell you what was happening um, with the allies at this time. So the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, was a precursor to the CIA and actually a precursor to American, American Special Forces Unit. So like the Navy SEALs, um, they, that all stems from the OSS. And in 41, with the war raging on, President Roosevelt realized he needed to coordinate intelligence. Um, that was going to be a big part of this war effort. And he tapped Major General William Wild Bill Dunman to head it up. And um, in June 1942, where the Secret Sailors begins, they changed the name to the Office of Strategic Services. And the headquarters was in DC on Navy Hill. This is General William Dunneman. He is a character in the book. He's, I didn't do a character based on him. I knew he had to be a character because he was the OSS. He was a World War I he war hero. And by all descriptions, like larger than life. Big, like he, uh, he's one of those people it sounded like he walked into the room and all eyes were ha on him. Huge amount of leadership and charisma. He was um, the most decorated soldier in the country's history after World War I. Um, he was incredibly brilliant and very, very brave as well. Um, he ended up taking over the OSS or starting the OSS for Roosevelt because they went to Columbia Law School together. So this is um, some OSS leaving for the continent Donovan had to build this spy organization that America had never had before, really, from scratch. And he, he, he leaned on the um, British for advice and help on how to do this. Um, but he had to build it very, very quickly and kind of fly by the seat of his pants. Um, he recruited only those he could trust. Uh, so he pulled from his network, from his own Ivy League network, from his work connections, from his society connections and hired a lot of people that he knew or knew their family, knew their father. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit, but um, it, it, was so, it got a little ridiculous. So in DC, the, um, the OSS earned the nicknames Oh So Social and Oh So Snobby, which I thought was pretty funny. However, he also recruited burglars and con men just out of prison. And one of these men I read about in multiple books, um, he was known as the Georgia Cracker because he was brilliant at cracking safes. And why, like, you know, I think Dunham said something to the effect of why train a Dartmouth grad to crack open safes when you can, you know, hire a convict who's been doing it for 30 years. So um, the Georgia Cracker, that was the only name I found for him, but he is a character in the book because he was a character in real life. So the women of the OSS, this picture is so fantastic. Um, this is some of the OSS women leaving for Europe. And Maggie Griggs was one of um, Donovan's right-hand women in DC. And she recruited women for the OSS. That was part of her job. But it was interesting, uh, you know, she complained because unlike the Wax and the Waves, who had huge kind of propaganda campaigns to recruit women, she couldn't in the ads, she had to be very kind of vague because this was, you know, this was a um, secret spy operation. So she had to be vague about what, so she had kind of just put these ads out for government workers looking for women to work for this government organization. Um, so that made it harder to recruit. But Dunham, of course, wanted, um, wanted everything in the women that she recruited. And so this is a quote from him, Get, remember this is 40s. Uh, cross between a Smith grad, so someone who's very smart, a Powers model, someone very pretty, or many women who are very pretty, and a Katie Gibbs secretary, that's the Katie Gibbs secretarial school, um, so women who are very organized as well. Um, a small percentage of the women had overseas assignments all over the world, and but an even smaller number of those served behind enemy lines as um, field agents, spies. I don't have an exact number because they actually, that number is still not disclosed by the OSS slash CIA. 
Um, I will. I did find though that there, the OSS had a parachute school, and if you were going to the parachute school, you were going to be in the field as an agent. And they trained 3,800 men at the parachute school and 38 women. I know. So I know at least 38 women were field agent spies, based on you know stories I read. I think it was at least you know at least over 100, but I don't have an exact number on that. So the OSS and SOE. They saw what was going on in occupied France, in France, and they saw the resistance rising, but it was very disorganized. There was different networks in different areas. They needed money, they needed guns. They had three things they needed to tackle, which were, each one was an enormous task. They had to help the French resistance be organized and train them in using guns, because some of these people were just farmers and things. Um, they had to, supply them with arms, like do, you know, midnight drops of arms and money in, you know, a field in the Loire Valley. Um, they had to engage in, you know, they wanted to help them engage in acts of sabotage to sabotage the Germans. So for instance, bombing railway lines so that the Germans, um, you know, German supplies would not reach wherever destination it was going. And then finally, uh, which, you know, ties into the book, they had to steal valuable German intelligence secrets. And often they had to do this by going undercover, completely changing their identity, changing their hair, sometimes changing their teeth. And um, that was probably, you know, all of these things were like tremendous tasks and, and also, of course, incredibly dangerous. Anna Cavanaugh, the main character in The Secret Stealers, goes undercover in France as a wireless operator. And um, that was a critical job at, for, for the spies in the field because it was the way that they were able to communicate with the allies. And, you know, you, they carried around these suitcases um, so, and, and the Germans kept getting more and more sophisticated in terms of how they could track down these wireless operators and catch them. They had vans with antennas that would go around different areas. Um, so at one point during the course of the war, um, the life expectancy for a wireless operator a spy in the field was six weeks. Um, so it was an incredibly dangerous job, but also really vital um, for the French resistance and the allies. So the story. Anna Kavanaugh is a young widow. She's teaching in DC. She's brilliant at languages. She speaks French and German. She spent some time studying abroad in Paris. Uh, and she is offered a job at the OSS by Donovan because of family connection. Donovan went to, you know, grew up in upper state New York and um, went to high school with um, Anna's father. So she, she had been kind of not loving her work as a teacher and she takes this job because she wanted a change and then she realizes that they're sending people in the field, they're sending women overseas and she's she, that is what she wants. She wants to go overseas and make an impact and you know, have a passion and a purpose. So eventually, uh, it takes a while, but she, eventually she convinces Dunneman to send her to France as a spy, as an undercover spy with a whole new identity. Before she goes to Paris, she's trained here at Bewley, which was in um, Hampshire, England, actually. This is a stunning estate, it's still there. They have a small um, museum dedicated to World War II and how it was used during World War II. And then it's, um, they've got a car museum there. I mean, it's, the grounds are massive. Like many um, of these large British estates during World War II, they, this was taken over by the SOE um, as a finishing school for spies. Um, so, Anna goes there with a group of women who are going to be going into going to the continent to various area, areas undercover and um, and she's trained in spycraft um, in explosives and burglary and of course wireless radio operation and encryption of messages and in acts of sabotage. And while she's here, she needs two characters who um, Tatiana is a composite of, of a lot of the women I read about um, in the, who were in the SOE. She was, she's a composite character of, you know, 
several Jewish, uh, several SOE agents. She's Jewish. She, you know, her fa she loses her father and brothers. They're taken, they're taken away in one of the roundups. Her family owned a bakery and she's a self-described former baguette girl. But like some of these women, what was intriguing, and I wanted to include her, a character like this is she never would have known, she was a brilliant spy and she never would have known that she had that talent had it not been for the war. Um, so she really kind of, it was like she was born for the role. Um, so Nora, on the other hand, who is based on the SOE agent, Nora Khan, um, was not born for the role. She did not seem to fit the description. She struggled with many aspects of it. Um, she was a really interesting person, descended from Indian royalty. She wrote children's books. She's been she was described by many as dreamy and ethereal and um, not really a good fit, but she, in the end, she surprised everyone. This is another picture of Noor, the real Noor Khan, beautiful young woman. I think this is when she was in her late teens in Paris. And this was her in her WAF uniform, Women's Auxiliary Air Force um, uniform. And then this is her, this next picture, it was stunt, the change is stunning when she is, uh, has to go undercover in Paris as a wireless operator, um, as her name, code name was Madeline. And she um, is, was one of the first women to go, uh, go into Paris as a field operator, as an agent. And I was like, you know, her hair has been lightened. She looks, she doesn't even look like the same person to me. I couldn't believe it when I first saw this photo, but this was Noor. Noor was working, her cover story was as a nanny in this building. And Nigel on our tour took us to this building. I think she was on the second or third floor. Um, and she was, um, turned out brilliant as a wireless operator and, um, you know, provided an incredible amount of intelligence for the allies. But, um, you know, one night someone gave up her cover and she was arrested and dragged out of this building and ended up executed at one of the camps at age 30. So this is Jeanne Rousseau. And um, I read about her story and she's French. She was in the French resistance. And I just, as soon as I heard her story, I was like, I can't even believe I had to include a character based on this woman, uh, I mean, a girl really, when, when all of this started, she was in her maybe 20, 21 years old. She's been called by some in the, you know, based on her accomplishments in the war as the most remarkable girl of her generation. She was very young when, the, when this all started, she was brilliant, she spoke many languages. Her family was pretty well off and so, when Paris was occupied, they fled to the city of Dinard near the coast. Um, and when she was there, she, her father got her a job working as a translator for the German officers in the area. And she started stealing secrets from them and for providing information to the allies there. Now the Germans that she worked with really liked her and they're like, oh, she, they treat her like this charming little girl. Um, but they, one of them started to get suspicious and they actually, she was actually arrested and imprisoned while she was in Denard. Um, but then the other Germans were like, no, it couldn't be her. But they said, you know, we don't think it was you, but you can't stay in the city anymore. So she, she left her family and returned to Paris and was eager to get back to the work of the French resistance work that she was doing. So she found the Druids network in Paris and ended up working with them. And once again, she found work as a translator working with German officers at the Hotel Majestic, um, which had been taken over in Paris by, the, um, by these officers. And she ended up on her own, this young girl stealing some of the most important se intelligence secrets of the war. She was extraordinary. And so um, I, I did not, you know, I, I didn't, I wanted to take some license in her story. So my character in, um, who is a friend of Anna Kavanaugh's is Josette Rousseau, and she is based on Genet. So this is another really interesting um, story in the book, Dr. Sumner Jackson. He was from Maine and he married a French woman. She was really homesick living in the US. So they moved back to Paris and he was one of the head doctors at the American hospital in Paris. This is him with his son, Philip, when he was a little boy. Um, so, when things started getting really bad, things started turning in Paris, 
Um, they, he, he decided along with his wife that they were not going to leave the city, even though they had the opportunity to. Um, they were going to stay and join the French resistance and help the Allies in any way they could. And this was important because the Hus American hospital was protected under the Red Cross. So um, what he was able to do is when POWs and allied, captured allied soldiers came through the hospital to be treated, he would often falsify their doc documents. And in fact, he, many of them, he just said, oh, um, you know, he wrote a death certificate. And then they went to, through an underground network to escape the city. So he was, he was extraordinary and so was his wife. Um, his house was on 11 Avenue Foch, which I'm about to talk about. And he offered it as a safe house for undercover agents. And it was also one of the many um, drop boxes for intelligence information through, that were throughout the city and actually throughout the country of France. So Avenue Foch is in the 16th arrondissement. Houses on this street are magnificent mansions. And I guess you could compare it to um, Park Avenue in New York City. They're just, it's a huge tree-lined boulevard. Uh, the houses are beautiful. Um, you know, many of the, so in World War II, when Paris was occupied, many of the families that lived in these enormous mansions, of course, had other properties. So they fled the city and went to their other properties. Of course, some of the J Jewish families that lived on this street were taken away. So of course, um, you know, the Germans decide because, I mean, you know, they're, they're instead of just taking like little flats or studios in other parts of the city no, you know, for their offices and for their lodging, they're going to take the best houses in on mansions in all of Paris. So they took over um, a number of houses on Avenue Foch, um, including 84 Avenue Foch, which was the headquarters of the, the Nazi secret police. Also I, in, the, in the book, I refer the, to them mostly as the Gestapo, just to, so it won't be confusing. They take a, this is a picture of 84 Avenue Foch um, on the top floor. Um, the Gestapo had a prison for um, captured French resistance fighters and captured allies. And, um, you know, uh, one thing that uh, I write about with doc Dr. Jackson, who lived nearby, would bike, bike by the 84 Avenue Foch at night, and he could hear the screams of the prisoners on the top floor um, being tortured, which was horrifying. Um, so, so it's interesting, too. Again, you talk about... Um, the shame and sort of the um, how Parisians feel about ha being an occupied city during World War II. And um, Nigel took us by this house and he said, I guarantee that um, the people who live there now have no idea of this horrible history of this, of this mansion. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. The Passy Bridge and the Passy Metro Station figure large in a pivotal scene in the novel. And you might recognize this bridge. Um, it's, it's beautiful and you can't see it from here, but there's a gorgeous and kind of unique view of the Eiffel Tower. This bridge is so popular that there was a number of Asian couples who flew in and they had all of the, they had, you know, wedding dress, tuxedo, they had a whole entourage for makeup. They had um, all their um, bridesmaids there and a photographer to have these magnificent fo wedding photos in, in, on the Passy Bridge, which it was just amazing. I think they were a little disappointed this particular day because it wasn't sunny, but um, I couldn't get over that. So, so yes, the, you might recognize it from the movie Inception, also was in Last Tango in Paris, among other movies, is kind of a famous landmark bridge in Paris. And it was, and it, like I said, it's, um, pivotal, it's a pivotal scene in the book as well. And the staircase is to the Passy Metro station in Paris. And when Nigel told us the story of this undercover British spy who was supposed to pass off critical intelligence on the second landing of the staircase here. Um, and so he, the night he was supposed to pass off of this intelligence on the second staircase, his contact didn't show. So he went back down and around on the other side, there's another staircase and he debated whether he could go back again. 
and he decided it was so important he had to go back. He had to see if the guy showed up, even though protocol said if they aren't there in the exact time, you leave, you get out. Um, but he could. He he decided to take the chance, and um, all hell broke loose, and he ended up getting arrested by the Gestapo and dragged away. Um, and it was interesting because the the man, his name was. Forrest U. Thomas, and after he he did survive the war, he had he has an apartment like a couple blocks down from from this station, from this staircase. And like Nigel was saying, like I wonder what he thinks every time he goes by. Um, you know, the night that changed everything in his life. You know, he sees this staircase. So that leads me to the covers. Um, uh, Lake Union Publishing is amazing. A lot of publishers do give you no say in what your cover looks like, but they are super collaborative. And, and so they gave me three original concepts for the cover. Um, I love them all. Like they're all beautiful in their own way. Um, you know, obviously, like I mentioned, bicycling, uh, you know, the, the, the women in the book, the spies in the book have to bicycle pretty much everywhere. So I, I, saw, I like the nod to the bicycle in the first picture. Um, this one has kind of like a, you know, mysterious romantic feel. Um, but, but one thing I noticed, once you start looking, you know, two of them had the Eiffel Tower, and then all of a sudden, everywhere I went, I felt like I saw books with the Eiffel Tower. Um, so I just, I just said, I said, you know, I think I want to mix it up. And to be honest, um, as soon as I saw these three, my eyes went to this third one. And I'm like, that it's not exactly it, but this is the one because it's the picture of the Passy Metro stairs and then this mysterious figure and it has the kind of like feel of drama and intrigue and mystery that this spy story that I want people to get from the cover of, of this spy story. Um, the only thing, one of the only things I wanted them to change was this person looks kind of zombie-like and I'm like, can you tighten up the silhouette and make it clear that it's a woman walking up the stairs? So then they came back with these three, um, with the various uh, shades of, of dark. And I, I went with the third one because um, like I said, this is a, a thriller, it's mysterious, it's kind of intriguing. And I, and I feel like this one gives it that vibe. Number three really gives it the vibe. So this is the story, this is the cover. And um, this was one of the photos of uh, that was inspiring, inspired me all the way through writing the book. There are so many of these. Um, and I, I love all of the history I've talked about tonight, the people, the places. I took all of that and I weaved it into this story about these two women who steal secrets that, you know, are, are on a mission to steal secrets from the Nazis that literally turn the tide of the war. It is high stakes. It's it's fast paced. There's a lot of twists. Um, there's still a lot of fr friendship and definitely a little bit of romance as well. But um, but I'm but all of the pieces I talked to about tonight, I weaved into this story that I just I hope you love it as much as I lo love it now too. Um, writing it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I'm not gonna lie. Um, but but I love the end product and I love the women who were involved. Um, and and like this one because they were just. They were badass. I know it's a ways out. March 2021 feels like forever in some ways, but if you could please consider pre-ordering The Secret Stealers. If you haven't subscribed to my newsletter, please do that. And, um, and of course, anytime you'd like to schedule an online book club, um, after, when the book comes out, please email me at jane at janehealy.com. Um, we can do it in person if people are doing in-person things then and you guys here nearby, or we can do it via Zoom, which has been awesome. I've been doing Zoom book clubs with, um, with book clubs all over the country since March, and that's been great. So thank you so much for staying on and listening. You all were awesome. It's such an honor to have so many people show up um, during all of this craziness and, and listen to us and listen to me um, talk about my stories. I cannot wait to share this one with you. Thank you for all of your amazing support all over the country. Um, you're just the best. Thank you very, very much.